Here in the studio today, we have a special treat. A returning guest, Reese Langston, comes to talk about his new project, Stalin Bollywood, featuring a few members of his Black Market Poets band. Now, Reese Langston, as some of you viewers may know previously, is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, musician, freelance eccentric, polite force of nature, winding essayists, mover through sound, media, performance, and other irregular singularities. Why don't we get started? How you doing? Thanks for having me again. What's good? What it is? As your fourth project in just over a year and a few months, how would you broach that fact with your words, which actually spoken on this show, in which you said artists are making too much music and need to slow down? I try to, but you know, I can't always live by my codes of ethics or whatever. And by that I mean, you know, I, I didn't expect for this to be an album. I just, uh, I just wanted to make different sounding songs. Um, and you know, you work on songs and after a while they reach a critical mass and that kind of happened maybe like a year and a half ago while working on Language Arts Unit. Um, you know, as I finished this project last year, um, in the same year that Language Arts Unit came out, I was, and I've waited almost a full 12 months before releasing, you know, so there has been restraint. You know, I don't think I make too many songs. Um, though I'll admit that restraint was informed by a little bit of caution at the subject matter and the divergence in style, you know, I almost didn't put it out. Um, I really don't get this way a lot, but with this project, for understandable reasons, maybe, you know, um, I was a little, little, little uh, cautious and afraid for the potential reaction to the work. Now, what would you say to those who might say your departure in style bears the shadow of a uh, certain self-sabotage in its sudden change? Yeah, you know, I thought about this and I respond, you know, sabotaging what though? I mean, I, you know, what, a thousand followers? Um, Thirty dollars a month for music? Uh, you know, I can do whatever I want to a certain extent because this press way is really low. As much as people oh. might ask for the next thing coming out or be praiseworthy of things, you know, uh, no one really gives a shit. And so I can do whatever I want. You know, that, 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 that reminds me of something uh, William Shakespeare once wrote, you know? You bitch ass niggas can fuck me today! <laughs> Whenever you say that, I always remember that, you know, I always remember that. <laughs> value you see in continuing to experiment and diverge? Experimentation is growth, is variety, is, is self-preservation to a certain extent. One of my biggest fears, actually, is being locked in place doing the same thing. Uh, that's what I kind of meant by people making too many songs. Not just since there was a volume, but when you have too many songs that everything bleeds together, I think there needs to be a, a certain sense of restraint uh, that is uh, emphasized, right? So, and by that, you know, I, I mean, motherfuckers really become a computer, like, in the way that actual music sounds, but also in a way that, you know, cast is putting out expectations and equations, you know? It, it's almost like you can string together the formula of what's going on, right? Some might call this a tribute record, something that is not wholly original or divining an entire new approach or sound. What would you say to that?
Oh, this is a tribute record. In the sense, I, I haven't really paid proper homage to the amount of rock and alternative music I listened to growing up. You know, new wave, alternative rock, a lot of classic punk music was, was all around me as a child and, and a teenager, you know, and I carry that music with me now as an adult. So this is my chance to pay respect and make music that very much resounds at, at that core in my artistic foundation. You know, there's many cores, but in that core. Are you fucking serious? You call this a fucking tribute record? You know how fucking hard this man works? He came to me with a bunch of fucking, bunch of fucking complete songs. He played all the parts himself. You will call a fucking tribute record. Why don't you take the fucking stems yourself and fucking do it, all right? These fucking people can say anything they fucking want without even having to substantiate a single goddamn thing. It is truly maddening. Now, I would say this project is still in hip-hop spirit in the sense that it is an homage, right? But rather than taking uh, interpolations or samples explicitly outside of like one or two loops that I really carefully um, selected and sampled, um, I used the feel of post-punk music, sampled the feel of alt-rock, experimental rock music to put forth a new tone to encase, you know, like the words and the uh, frame of mind that my music has always had and always will have. Nah, I mean, you know, he came to me, he was talking about, you know, what if I like put down like like the, the, the hyper lyrical multi and tantra rap shit, you know, and I just was like on some punk shit now, bro. And I said, you know, that's cool. That's cool, but you gonna do it, cause you know, I got the motherfucking machine, bro. I got the profit, you know. I got the motherfucking profit. I got the fucking Juno, nigga, you know. Like, we can either do this, or you can fucking woof, you know what I'm saying? Is you gonna woof, or is we gonna make some punk shit? And he did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> that is it was crazy. deal in controversy or heresy on this project, what was the motivation in foregrounding that kind of language or approach? Do you think there's a, a danger in doing that and playing with those manner of operations, approaches, lenses? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a little bit, you know. It's if we have like this Western teleological lens, church slash state slash faith slash authority, you know, being intertwined from the beginning, that meant that heresy was the first controversy. So now in this golden age of controversy, you know, anything worth considering has to have shock value or some kind of outrageous virality to even get a perpetually distracted people to pay attention. Um, and the way I see it, you know, is unfortunately subtlety only seems to work if one's PR or marketing strategy has a good enough handle on like rolling out mystery or mythology. You know, so like others with conspicuous and loud culturally replicable means of broadcasting being loud as hell so other people can be silent, you know, they can co-sign and reify that. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of uh, uh, an old proverb I used to hear, you know, the old man on the corner say, uh, I want to know something like this. Um, a man who has no profile, well, he ain't got no fronts neither, you know? Ah, <laughs> uh, man, that one always stuck with me, you know what I'm saying? That one always stuck with me, I really know. <laughs> you know, I think mystery, Subtlety, nuance, ironically, have to be over the top. Look at Earl Sweat, who was allowed to have a kind of mysterious aura that he cultivated into a present personality of subtlety and ambiguity, but only after he started out with shock value, right? His whole narrative of being sent to boarding school, framed up as a lockup after using explicitly violent content referencing rape, murder, etc., you know, 
Um, that works because it was true, but he was tied to the biggest groups and cultural moments in the last two decades. He had it all set up to be both controversial and mysterious. And now in his elder matured uh, uh, statesman role, uh, he can be declarative and subtle by, by whim, you know? Um, and in that role, now he broadcasts other people. And I know it's not about him, it's about the climate of attention, so I'm not trying to, you know, pinpoint it. You know, I, I think his transformation to what he is now is in large part due to his discomfort at this fact of life. At least I surmise, right? You know, the question like, do you have to be an attention whore in order to, in, in, that, same, uh, in that same idea, be chaste? You know what I mean? You have to be an attention whore to be uh, attention chaste. Whatever. What are the limits of that approach? Hey, you know, bro, I really f with your questions, bro. I really f with your questions. Like, you actually, like, not, like, talking about the fing bullshit. I really appreciate you, bro. For real, dog. Hmm. Subtlety becomes harder to get back or be traced back, you know, when the fever pitch is really the concern, you know, and, and, and the compression and the range of dynamics, you know, everything being squeezed into this mode of outrage, surprise, and shock, that does not substitute, or that's not a substitute for understanding, parsing, or doing the work of trudging through ideas. If controversy is appropriated to lead someone to examination, well, you know, that that's a powerful tool. I, I, how would I describe, you know, similar to um, how with music in general, like I, I wrote a lot about in language arts, you know, now a catchy musical component can draw a listener into a song with more complex structure or a lyrical concept or whatever. Um, that's how maybe controversy can be appropriate. Um, often though, you know, it's left as a surface level interaction and it's like driving by a car crash. In this change, I see a little bit of your hesitancy around the trappings of hip hop and rap. Are you positing that this genre exploration on which you're undergoing, are you positing yourself greater than hip hop? <laughs> to paraphrase something I wrote before, you know, rap and hip hop are interconnected, but two discrete and separate things. Hip-hop's essence, you know, the fundamental doing away with asking for permission or for to proceed, you know, that's the ultimate, to me, the ultimate form of recontextualizing material and re-authenticating it for you and yours and also being aware of that, you know? Um, nowadays, we have these, like, titans of industry, major labels, major studios, major publishers, whatever, appropriating DIY aesthetics. So, you know, the revolutionary political importance of taking control of one's creativity, I think that should be ever more foregrounded. You know, by this I mean, you know, we have to really look at who is the creator. But not only who is the creator, how do they situate themselves or how are they situated in relation to capital, investment, wealth, and its place in the history uh, present and future of colonialism, imperialism, and uh, if you will, the catalytic converter of capitalism, you know, and that engine. You know, that reminds me of something that um, uh, Virginia Woolf, she wrote, she put down, and she said, um, everybody want to be a nigga, but don't nobody want to contribute to their 401k, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Rap and hip hop are connected because, well, in the social imaginary, they are black music regions. Urban race music, as much as there is a sound, you know, it's more like signifying in cultural luggage to transport between the two names and designations. To a very real extent, I had to say, you know, when making this shit, it doesn't matter what type of music I make. If I make it, it's black music. You know, I don't really, I don't really give you, I don't really be giving a damn about these white boys appropriating shit out here, you know? Cause you know, I'm just trying to be, you know, tears for fears me Zaytoven out here, you feel me? 
I don't I just played a sense, bro. I just played a sense. My radio was integrated. I don't care about what they say. This can't be, bro. Like, I'm in it. You know what I mean? I'm in it, bro. You know, I listen to Billy Idol. I listen to Billy Holiday. I listen to Billy Woods, motherfucker. You know, I listen to Billy Ocean. Nigga. But I think it's going to make more sense in retrospect, maybe with like five albums down the line, if I can even do that. My genre is the use of language and of almost voice actor like personalities and my vocal manipulation and tone rather than the sound, right? It's the, it's the underpinning, the undercurrent of ideas. And what might we ask? is genre's usefulness in this day. Well, you know, most popular, and by popular I mean like American, Western, or but also increasingly non-Western, Global North, musical genres, you know, they're influenced by the cultural dominance of hip hop and rap and, you know, the electrified evolution. Not always an appropriative affect, you know, but I mean like in production style, so in standard rock albums, there people are even adding, you know, uh, occasional 808s under kicks to uh, compete with the loudness and heft of modern hip hopified, if you will, music. Um, and as American imperialism, like pop culture, continues to eat itself, and by that I mean, you know, like constantly requiring the most optimized, money-making, bottom of the barrel originality, mass marketable intellectual property. Genre in all forms and all media and all products is just the kind of way in, of inserting something into the strictures of the marketplace. You know, there is this notion, I think, that we've forgotten about that genre will reveal the idea of what something is before you interact with it. You know, in the sense that uh, you can decide whether you're interested in something before you even have to give it the time of day. You know, one of my favorite bass lines that he played on that one was, um... to confine people into these stupid f***ing categories. Who created the f***ing categories? Not me! Not him! God! Sorry, man. She get back to your f***ing interview. I'm just here. I'm just here, you know. Whatever, man. Is directness in contrast to your previous work in nuance, subtlety, and ambiguity, is, is, is that the trajectory in which you're on now? Uh, I hate using this word because I've used it a lot right now, but my work exists in a marketplace. As much as I would not like to frame it solely that way, you know, but the marketplace, as you know, we talked about, it's mediated by this informational landscape that, that uh, I don't know, it's kind of hell-bent on pushing us towards simplicity, vulgarity, extractive efficiency, extractive, extractive, you know, at whatever cost. So, you know, I mean, it's not really hyperbole that we are actively discouraged from thinking and lingering with ideas and thinking deeply about matter, you know? So, I think I'm actively appraising my reality and the constraints of the hegemony of industry, sorry, all oh, big words, you know, right now things are very loud and fast and confusing and they turn over quickly, you know, though I was working on some of these songs now maybe three years ago, I think where we're at now has been a steady incline or maybe even decline to the societal point, and uh, I don't know, I believe I've been tapped in enough to recognize and try and speak within the language and tone of today. Uh, 
I mean, I totally fucking understand it. I, I, I gave up being subtle, being fucking nuanced years ago. Because, you know, I would try and talk, and people would think about, people would think about, you know, how I'm pronouncing things, what my fucking enunciation is, and they wouldn't even fucking listen. It didn't matter what fucking synonyms I knew, what definitions I knew, it was, it was the fact that I was coarse, alright? I was coarse in how I formed my words. You know what I had to fucking do? I just fucking went for it. And I just started telling people to their faces, you for the shit, you for the shit, you alright, you alright, you, all right. you you've got a little potential there. You know, we all works in progress, you know, but if someone can tell me I couldn't even fucking speak right, I can tell them that they were fucking cross shit. Oh, are we recording? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess me to think, you know, when I've sent work to people who have remarked that things like beats or vocal delivery could be a weirder to reflect perhaps uh, the content of the lyrics or concepts. But, you know, I'm trying to be as pure as possible about my shit. And so. I want to be seen more publicly, uh, you know, to share what I have. And I know that visibility, you know, something that comes with caution and in some form the opposite of subtlety. But I'm trying to speak directly. And right now, if that means wiling out a bit, so be it. Whatever. Eventually, I'll be able to be direct while balancing, you know, more nuance and subtlety. People won't brush over it, but at least that's the help. Now, you know, I understand the need to vary your touch. This guy right here, he's super patient. Reese Lacey, he's super patient, man. You've got to give him fucking credit. He's been making bangers. Fucking straight bangers, bro. It's crazy. And he's been doing it with fucking the dark. No fucking help. He called me in because I can play the bass live. If he can play the bass live and rap, he fucking do it himself too, but he can't do that. It's all right, he can do enough. He can pack, he can write, he can motherfucking rap, he can sing, he can mix, engineer, he can act, he can voice act his fucking head off. Fuck that off, I don't know. What the fuck do we fucking work though? I can't fucking speak anymore. All I've got to say is, stop playing with the fucking men, all right? Stop playing with him, download his new fucking album, you're being fucking stupid, alright? Don't let these fucking people determine what you're interested in. Develop your own fucking aesthetic. Stop doing this stupid shit, man. Fucking tired of it. A A A A A A A A A A A A A A O A O A O A O A O O O O O O